Hi there. My name is Richard Griffiths. I'm director of the new Silk Roads Research Project at the International Institute for Asian Studies. The Institute is a global humanities and social science research foundation. Its aim is to contribute to a better understanding of present-day Asian realities, as well as to reformulating Asian studies in a changing global context. Let me tell you something about myself. I was born in 1948 just outside London as the eldest of a family of four children. My own school experience, especially secondary school, was pretty ghastly, so I'll skip that bit. After leaving school, I worked for a year as a statistics clerk before going to university. At Swansea, I studied economic history and Russian studies did sufficiently well to be accepted to do a PhD at Cambridge, Jesus College to be precise. Here I worked on why the Dutch did not industrialise as they should have done at the start of the 19th century. After all, it seemed to have all the necessary preconditions. The answer, by the way, is that where they had cheap coal, they had expensive labour, and where they had cheap labour, they had expensive coal. Not a good combination at the time. Anyway, in 1973, I became a lecturer at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, teaching in a brand new interdisciplinary European Studies degree. My teaching and research interests now broadened into the 20th century, especially into the European Economic Community, which the United Kingdom had just joined. While I was there, I was approached to apply for the Chair of Economic History at the Free University of Amsterdam, and much to my own surprise, in 1980, I was appointed. Now, living and working in the Netherlands with its fairly relaxed policy on archive access also allowed me to be at the forefront of historical research into the origins of European integration. And so it was that I became Professor of Contemporary History at the European, European University Institute in Florence, and director of its European Integration History Project. The European University Institute was an independent postgraduate PhD research institute with strong bonds to the European Union. It allowed me to work in archives throughout Europe and the USA and to have contact with the policymakers who had shaped the events I was studying. In many ways, it was a charmed existence with one drawback the maximum contract was for eight years. And so it was that in 1995 I had to return to the real world. Of Leiden University. Although I was back in my role as Professor of Economic and Social History, I was given considerable freedom to innovate. Alongside the regular humanities syllabus, we established so-called practical studies to prepare humanities students for the labour market. The options included European Union studies, which we later developed as an independent master's programme. However, the most challenging task I faced was to combine all the regional expertise that we had in the faculty, and one of the greatest concentrations in the world, into an integrated international studies BA programme. This started from scratch in 2015 with over 300 first-year students and I became the university's first professor of international studies. Throughout these years, I was able to follow my research interests and to work on many different topics. Of course, there always remained a strong interest in economic history, and that of the Netherlands in particular. But a history of a trade-dependent country like the Netherlands could not be told without a strong international component. And in the post-war period, that component lay in Europe. This, of course, dovetailed with the work that I was doing in Florence. And when I returned to the Netherlands, my focus became even more contemporary and, to be honest, more international. And ultimately, it focused on China's Belt and Road Initiative. I suppose I should explain how this came about. Economic historians have always been interested in factors of economic development. 
and infrastructure and trade have always been seen as drivers of economic growth. But there's a more specific reason. Back in 2006, I was asked to lead in the creating of a European study centre in Western China. It collected universities in Xinjiang, Lanzhou and Xi'an. It was called the Silk Road Centre for European Studies, and it still exists. That, of course, awakened my interest in the history of the old Silk Road. Years later, I was also in Renmin University as China was building its high-speed railways to the west. And so, when in September 2013 the Belt and Road Initiative was announced, I began to follow developments. When the questions I was asking were not being answered, I wrote my own book on the topic. It was published in May 2017. That same month, I was invited as a delegate to the first International Belt and Road Forum in Beijing. My research has always tried to place China's Belt and Road Initiative in an international context, to see what developments had preceded it, what else was taking place, and what else was happening in parallel to it. Two more books have since followed. Now, the IIS New Silk Road project has attracted researchers from all over the globe. It now has its own website, Facebook group, Twitter page, electronic libraries, newsletter, and a whole host of podcasts. Aside from my own research, a series of lectures and conferences have helped fill the rest of my time. And here are just a few of the most recent ones, including the very last one I gave in China, at Ocean University in Quindao. With the current pandemic raging over Europe, I wonder when that will be possible again. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed listening to this brief background to myself, and I look forward to seeing you all online again sometime soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye.